lovely walk though. We need Dr. Oh, Daniels coming soon. Oh, here's. I didn't catch where that was. Where is it? Right there. You're not Richard. All Nixon. right. Uh, secretary. Sorry, we had a whole hour and I wasted the very last time. I did. Yeah, I mean, minutes. come on. This is what my students do. <laughs> Let me go get the other one. <laughs> where did they learn it from their parents? <laughs> I suppose so. <laughs> Probably will. All right. Well, good evening. Welcome to the continuation of our d evening, but this is the beginning of our regular meeting for the SoCal Creek Water District. Um, roll call will show all of the directors here. We have no public hearing. And I thought that we would start with item 6.2 rather than the first item, which is something that we really enjoy doing. And um, the video contest is really exciting and I love to see all of the energy that students put into creating these and I think it's a great program. So we have nine winners that were awarded for their original videos for the about, this one was about Waterwise Gardens at the SoCal Creek Water District. Um, so anyway, the, we have, um, this is the fifth annual student made video contest um, organized by the Water Conservation Coalition of Santa Cruz County and the Monterey County Water Awareness Committee. And over 90 videos were submitted from Aptos High School, Carmel, Gonzales, Pajaro Valley, Scotts Valley, Watson, and Watsonville High School. So we have, I don't know whether to start, well, I guess I'll start from the top instead of like, at the, like in third place. Um, so um, the top winning videos, um, there are two, um, and they are going to receive a $500 um, gift for their for their work and um, we have certificates as well um, do we want to show each one now or the first one is drought tolerant plants by Malia Kesslery from Aptos High and the other award is three easy ways to be more water wise by Winston Matwandel from Scotts Valley High School Great. And we have both them in the crowd. using plants that require less water will help save our environment after three years Drought tolerant plants may need no additional water, whereas water wasting plants may need water daily. If you switch, you can save your water bill and your environment. show the other videos after we present or yeah, maybe show them idea. yeah so let's let's honor them and then also we want to honor um, Joel Domhoff who's a teacher I think both at Scotts Valley and at Aptos High I know I know he's at Aptos High and so I want to congratulate um, him as well for all that good work so can we ask the um, Malia and Winston and Joel to come up please Yeah. <laughs> 
to show a couple more videos yep. yes then uh winners must stick around for the entire meeting <laughs> <laughs> you do not um, let me just list the winners okay yeah. so the other winners that will also get um 350 dollars per video team uh, we have one by rosemary seha from watsonville high school called water conservation um last and there's another a second one is las nativas son amigas by azucena lopez brianna lopez Sotil Martinez, those are from Pajaro Valley High. Um, Be Wise to Your Garden, or In Your Garden, by Chase McChrystal from Carmel High School. And fourth is Types of Gardening, by Jessica Zavala, Jasmine Tapia, Jasmine Jimenez, and Jasmine Limon from Watsonville High. Wow, three Jasmines. Different spelling. All right, and I also want to note the, or should we note the teachers and the Oh, schools? yes, sorry. And then there were also three honorable mentions. There's Capitan Agua by Gustava Nunez and Angel Valdez from Watsonville High School. Water Conservation WHS Video Academy by Juan Garcia Vega from Watsonville High. And Waterwise Gardening 2019 by Maria Vasquez Gonzalez from Watsonville High. And other teachers were Dale Poor from Watsonville High School. Kyla Plumley from Pajaro Valley High and Joe Mello from Carmel High School. So, enjoy. All right. Students from Watsonville High School. Use a watering can instead of sprinklers to save a lot of water. Plant water saving lots of black space at the end. We, we didn't dock her for those. <laughs> Jay-Z. Oh, Valley High. Oye, tiempo reemplazar esos jardines. Te voy a decir como pa' que no lo adivines. El agua hay que conservar. Así que plantas nativas hay que agregar. A ortiga y mele rama yo te las presento. Reducen el consumo hasta un 60%. Hay que cuidar el medio ambiente. No seas desobediente. Mejor si inteligente. Yeah. <laughs> student is from Carmel High. Did you know using mulch and compost helps create healthy soil? You can find free and low-cost mulch from local tree trimming companies. This may seem like a very small change. Uh-oh. But trust me, it goes a long way. So make sure to be wise in your garden.
siento que el agua se está gastando. ¡Capitán Agua! Hola. Este escenario es muy común. Capitán Agua está sirviendo mucho por todo el gasto de agua cada año. Con el poder de suculentas, podemos cambiar el futuro de jardines. Con esta planta, podemos salvar mucha agua. Por favor, ayúdanos. Those are all the videos. Everyone wants this kind of lawn in front of their house to depict the notions of hard work. A lot of these lawns tend to cause some problems. They waste an abundance of water and cost money and work. That's why low maintenance gardens like these help improve the environment. They use wetless water in traditional lawn using succulents and other low water usage systems to conserve water, which can save you a total of 63,000 gallons over time. So go to your local nursery or garden locations to begin your future water saving garden because saving the environment is like saving the world. There was one more. one more according to our list, but... Oh, I, th uh, I guess that's all that I had queued okay. up there. A couple people didn't fill out their forms, so Check. we can't show them on TV yet. All right. Okay. Well, yeah. once again, thank you all so much, and y you really don't <laughs> have to stay for the whole meeting. It's okay. <laughs> I'd say that's you should <laughs> <laughs> But you are welcome to. And I just want to follow up that all of these videos are online at watersavingtips.org under the resources and the 2019 video contest. And they're going to be pr um, shown on KION, Telemundo, Estrella, KSBW, uh, Cinema 9 in Santa Cruz, okay. and online. We and also at Cinema 9 before the movies. Oh. Cinema right. 9 before the movies, yeah. Oh, Good. cool. Good. Thank you. Vi, do we have a link on our website to these? There will be. Okay, great. It's just got the last form. Permission <laughs> 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 form to share. And, and Vi, thank you for your work on that. Really yeah. good work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a blast every year. All right, so let's move on to the consent agenda. Anyone have anything they would like to pull? Nothing for me. Any um, comments from the public on the consent agenda? Good evening, thank you. Becky Steinbrunner, resident of Aptos. At your last meeting, um, because you had a closed session that began your meeting and you took oral comment on that closed session before that happened, the, um, that public comment was not recorded and is not on your video recording on your website. And I confirmed that that was gonna happen at the time, last, last meeting. What I asked was that there be some detailed notes about what the public comment um, said. And I was disappointed to see that that didn't happen in your minutes. It just says there were two public comments. So I know you've just gotten a really couple of really nice awards in transparency. And I know that you really want to do a good job informing the public. So again, I ask that, um, uh, and, and I also know that you only have to take action minutes, but in that case in particular, especially since you had a request from the public to have more complete minutes for this section of the meeting that was not going to be video recorded, that, um, that those efforts increase in the future that the meeting, uh, that minutes include uh, public comment regarding closed session items with more detail or any part of a pub of the, your public meetings that are not gonna be video recorded. And to that end, um, I would like to ask that the board consider including video recording of your special board meetings. None of those have video recordings. I've, I've recorded your budget meeting here tonight and I've recorded some of your other special board meetings, but those special board meetings are just as important as your regular board meetings are. And it, in fact, it's more important for them to be available on video to the public because they are often at unorthodox times and unorthodox locations. So the public may not even know that they're going on. So uh, please consider that. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Um, no other 
comments? I'll move approval of the consent agenda. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Great. All right. Um, now it would be time for oral communications on any items not on tonight's agenda. Thank you. Becky Steinbrunner, resident of Alpcas. Um, again, at your last board meeting, I had submitted written communication and embedded in it was an attachment that I asked within my letter to you to be opened and included as part of the communication. It was not. So um, and what it was, and I have a copy and would like to submit it for the minutes tonight, is a copy of the Haley Aldrich um, hydrologist report that was commissioned by Cabrillo Community College District and the report is dated June 9, 2017. Your district has considered until very recently putting um, one, possibly two, injection wells associated with the Pure Water SoCal project at, Com at Cabrillo College campus. And um, in doing Public Records Act request work, the campus, the college tells me you are no longer discussing this option with them. And it appears that um, the injection well for that area is uh, going to only be at Twin Lakes Baptist Church. I have a lot of issues with that. Um, but what I want to talk with you about tonight is uh, just reviewing for you and any of those in the public listening uh, watching this live stream is this was an evaluation of proposed injection well on Cabrillo College campus. One of the wells was um, scheduled to be directly across the street from the location where the Twin Lakes Church injection well is. It would not have required any tree removal. The Twin Lakes Church well, as you know, did a lot of oak trees that were habitat for solitary roosting bats. They were destroyed in the winter when the bats were in torpor. And um, the, the water that is now promised to a private entity, Twin Lakes Church, could have gone to Cabrillo College to water their athletic fields. That's a, pro a public entity. I think it would have been a better deal for the people. So I'm almost out of time. What I want to uh, read here for you is that um, it is unknown the effects of the injection well on Cabrillo College's private wells. The location of the proposed injection well on the Cabrillo College campus is a bit curious. Most other managers of coastal aquifers in California that have implemented seawater intrusion barriers using arrays of injection wells have installed the barriers as close as possible to the coast, and they give the examples of Los Angeles. That way, much or all of the injected water, typically recycled water in the LA Basin and Orange County, discharges to the ocean rather than being captured in water supply wells. In the SoCal Aptos, they're pointing out that it's going to go to your well. That's Thank what you. they're saying. And they're also worried that it's going to go to their well. Thank you. Time is up. Thank you. I will submit this and please include it in the minutes. Is Thank you. Anyone else that wishes to address the board? All right. Seeing none. We'll move on to item 6.1. Oh, yep, we have, I'm sorry, director. Yeah. I just want to share that this afternoon I was approached by a member of the public who unsolicited um, complimented the, the water board on the job they're doing. We hear a lot of the negatives and often we don't hear the positives. So I just wanted to share that with the staff and, and other board members. Thank you. Sorry about Thank that. you. Anyone else? Okay, then we will move on to 6.1. Sorry about that. That's all right. 5.1. 5 5.1 5 is management update. Sorry. So for uh, conservation customer service field, I reported out on our AMI project upgrade, um, stormwater recharge project, and Tyler upgrade. Were there any questions on on any of those items? Okay. No. Okay. And then. Engineering. Yeah, I had a couple bullets. Um, we're moving forward, as you saw on the agenda tonight, hopefully awarding uh, the contract for the remaining improvements at the Granite Way well. 
uh, ramping up for the SoCal Drive cast iron main replacement, and then also making progress at the Twin Lakes Church project. We're in our second uh, phase of recharge testing as we speak. Great, thank you. I forgot Any to questions say for Taj? <laughs> huh? I forgot to say something. I got the outreach. Oh, great. Yeah, card, and it was beautiful. I really liked it, and um, I was excited because I didn't know you guys were doing <laughs> stuff out there. So thank you. Okay. <coughs> um, the only thing I have to add is that today I was informed that PG&E is expanding their public safety power shutoff program this for this next wildfire season to include um, tier two sites right now uh, or last year it was tier three which were extreme um, fire danger um, as determined by the CPUC and so that um, included about 65 percent of our facilities and with the addition of tier two it's all but one so we're going to have to evaluate how that's going to impact us um, probably with the need for yet even more generators and trying to figure out how to get that much fuel to our sites every day. So, what is it, Do they have a schedule? Like, what It's just based on weather conditions, I think, right? Uh, mostly, yeah, weather conditions and um, humidity and vegetation dryness is basically what it is. They have some sort of algorithm to... Um, there's no real algorithm. It could be based on one of those factors, like a red flag warning, or multiple factors. But they're 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 gun shy now, so they're probably going to be calling them, you know, more often than not. Um, and they they say to expect it to last between two to five days each power shut off. Wow. And then. Who's making that call? Is it California PG. Public Utilities? No, PG&E makes the PG &E call. PG&E makes that call. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do we have a number for how much water got transferred from the North Coast during the shut? Um, it was on the production report. Yes. Or no? 43. Yeah, 43 for uh, April. Total. There's a total, isn't there? Yeah, there's a total in... 139? I know there's... Oh, plus the 74, there? right? Yeah, so, pl no, plus 26, so. Um, it is in the production reports. Yeah. 165 yeah. acre feet, I think, would be the, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's true. Thank you. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> For my report, I um, just want to go over f a couple points that is in the report, and I also want to touch on the event that we had this last weekend. But district staff did participate up in Sacramento last, last week uh, at an event called Point Positive, which really focused on one water aspects and drought, drought proof resilient supplies. Uh, we even um, tabled at an outside event. It was pouring rain, but Rebecca and Vi, uh, along with several environmental groups, were out there for the majority of the afternoon greeting people and sharing information. And we tabled it actually right next to Pure Water Monterey. Um, also wanted to just touch on, um, we've d done a lot of outreach events in this last month since we reported and the dates and some of the events that were there. Um, Vi did a lot of her end of the year classroom events, spending you know multiple days um, in the middle schools. And then lastly, just in terms of some of the, um, the coordination with the community water plan and the Pure Water SoCal project, we did talk to the board about bringing the community water plan progress update this this month. Um, we are going to be bringing it in June, so you will be seeing that. And then we are still continuing uh, with district staff, city staff, on some of the preliminary design aspects. In fact, some of the drawings that we want to show, um, Taj is going to queue up. But um, in terms of the Pure Water SoCal project, we did have an event this weekend that I just wanted to share. It was on Saturday, again raining, um, at the Live Oak Grange from 3 to 5, and we had about 30 to 35 people show up. 
Um, many people uh, came with an open mind to understand what the project was, what the problems of water challenges were. Uh, we had district staff there, our Pure Water SoCal team. We also had representatives there, Sierra, from the Mid-County Groundwater Agency, and we had two representatives from the Regional Transportation Commission. So those are just some pictures of the event. In terms of the information that we shared, uh, we did have um, at the event a Spanish translator. Um, she also uh, was the one who translated all of our meeting material and the flyers. So she ha was ready and available if, if anybody needed it. Um, what we're gonna show right now are the information boards that were at each station. We had different information stations. It was an open house style, so people could come in and, and at their leisure go around. The first station really focused on seawater intrusion and the challenges that we're facing. That's just an illustration of what the um, seawater intrusion prevention well would do in, f in front of um, an extraction or production well. And if we didn't have that, that's where seawater intrusion. Um, this is one of our new graphics that illustrates how the Pure Water SoCal project would create tertiary uh, recycled water, that's the purple that would go to the city of Santa Cruz for some of their uses. It would also be the source water for the purification facility and then the three injection wells or seawater intrusion prevention wells in the Capitola Aptos area. <coughs> we did have a station just, you know, to talk about a lot of the project benefits, um, focusing, you know, primarily on, although there's eight showing there, really it, it boils down to three. There's the environmental issues, the environmental benefits, um, reducing water, green, uh, using green power, um, creating that seawater intrusion barrier, also focusing on the funding aspects of, you know, promoting economic vitality, and then talking specifically about the project and that um, it could be scaled up, that um, it could be built in a somewhat timely manner, not contingent on water rights, and there's regulatory issues that are in place for this project to, go to move forward, and um, that, of course, it is a drought-proof supply. This is one that you guys are probably familiar with. This is the same th uh, thing as the other schematic, but really just overlaying on a map. And then we unveiled um, some architectural renderings. So we, um, as part of the basis of design reports that the board approved a couple months ago, uh, we had these drawings available to, to attendees to see what the conceptual ideas could be for purification. There's two different types that we um, unveiled in terms of the look and feel. This is called integrating nature, showing more kind of an environmental um, aspects of the facility site. What's nice about these drawings um, and a little bit different from what we had in um, the environmental impact report is that we've been able to incorporate the bike pedestrian bridge. So that's a view on, um, on the bridge. And you can see what um, the architect did was, um, obviously they, ha they have their renderings, but what they also incorporated in, in some of those bottom squares of some of the illustrations are potential design features. And those are photographs of the actual conceptual ideas that are in place at other utilities. So um, kind of a, a nice art, wall art, uh, demonstration gardens, learning center, living roof, uh, some of the kind of ideas to kind of spur discussion at the event. So I think that's the end of the um, graphics we wanted to show just to kind of wrap up uh, mine. The next meeting that we'll be having is on Thursday, May 30th, uh, 630 to 830 at the Live Oak Grange. Yeah, I'll just add that uh, I think we had about 35 people attend and I think about 30 of those people came in you know, open-minded, curious, and, and uh, left, I think, feeling better with the information l being provided and that sort of thing. Uh, I was at the, uh, the Y booth, as we called it, the problem challenge statement. And when we showed the map, maybe go back to that one, Taj, if you could, uh, that very first map that shows the problem. When we showed the, uh, the outline of the MGA, the Mid-County Groundwater Basin, the yellow line there uh, that, that surrounds it, and then that there's several wells in the Live Oak area, 
basically showing that what's pumped out of those three wells equates to about a third of the uh, problem, 1,500 acre feet. So they pump about 500 acre feet a year. Uh, their, urban wa their urban water management plan indicates they could actually were projected to be pumping three times that much. So it's interesting, but uh, that that as we've seen before, you know, it's it's they always ask why 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 are you considering putting this facility or putting this facility here in Live Oak. And, and that's, that's the starter, and then we go, uh, and they go, oh, so, you know, we do have skin in the game, uh, and then the answer is yes, uh, it's zoned that facility, and it goes on. Uh, the, the other thing that people, I think, appreciated and they didn't know about, even though the EIR has been completed and it's been in the works for a while, was the pedestrian overpass, uh, bicycle overpass. So seeing conceptual drawings of that, that definitely, not everybody, there were a few people that, that were, uh, not jazzed about that, I have to say, but for the most part, the vast majority were glad to see us working with that and willing to accommodate it. And you know, there were lots of good ideas. One uh, idea I remember when I was looking at the uh, conceptual uh, renderings with uh, a member of the public, they said, well, when you come down the bike ramp, maybe in the, in the living roof or whatever you have there, you should do the letters L-O, because you know, that's all live oak, that's all we really have as a symbol, we don't have much else. But, you know, so there was input like that uh, consider, you know, provided along the way, and we took notes. So it was a good event. And the next one is what time on the 30th? E evening. Pardon? 6.30 to 8.30. Okay, thank you. Yeah. There's flyers in the back. And we were, uh, Melanie and I were fortunate enough to do a radio show the morning of and uh, to publicize the event and everything. Sure. Yeah, down at KSCO, I believe. Great, nice work. Yeah, very nice work. Don't take this comment the wrong way, especially. Uh, but I do think we should also include the the uh, negatives, and I don't know yeah. if it was. Okay. To me, the two big negatives are the cost and the energy use. Right. So, just o to of the f of the f uh, of of going with the project with in general okay. with advanced water purification, and I, you know, nothing's per you know nothing. We don't have a better alternative, so that's there is no perfect solution. No perfect solution. You know, we we certainly the, the worst solution is seawater intrusion. We all I think all agree on that, and so um, to let that happen would be a, a travesty. Yeah. Okay, um, finance I think, and then we already kind of handled finance, yeah. right? Yeah, <laughs> finance is handled. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes, ma'am. I don't have anything to add, but I just um, wanted to, hopefully you had an opportunity to see some of the feedback that we shared with the board um, from our staff survey. Um, we were excited that we had really good participation with that, and um, we look forward to working with that data and those results um, as we move <coughs> forward. So we wanted to share that with the board kind of preliminarily. And any other questions? Well, it sounds really upbeat. Yeah. Yeah, we had really great comments. Do you do that every year? This was the first time. First time. Yeah. Okay. Seems like it'd be a it's great. good process. Yeah. To yeah, we hope to kind of make this as a baseline and continue on with that. It's important to know what our staff are feeling and be responsive to well that. Well, yeah. I mean, somebody left and then came back again. I mean, something <laughs> must be good. <laughs> <laughs> We're we got that a good. We've got a couple <laughs> of those. <laughs> Twice. Yeah. Fortunately. All right. Um, thank you, Tracy. Um, Ron. So, yeah, I, I have a couple items here. The first I want to start with, uh, I think it was one of the board members just mentioned the uh, uh, public, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Jaffe. Um, we, we a lot of times hear the negative, uh, but we got an email, and this is kudos to, to Shelley and I guess all of us at the board, uh, from a local landscaper, Golden Love, and he does a lot of uh, gray water and that sort of thing in town, and I asked him if it was okay if we shared his email. I didn't print it out, but uh, he basically said in one line, you guys have the best rebates in the, I think he said state, uh, conservation rebates. And so that's coming from a, a person who's out there day in, day out, and it just, it means a lot from somebody who's doing that, and I think it was heartfelt. And so I actually said, hey, do you mind if I mention that at a board meeting? He said, absolutely, take take it, please use it. It's, a, it's Great. what he feels. So along with that, you, uh, there was an editorial, guest editorial in the paper that I think had a lot of misinformation in it, and uh, 
So soon after it came out, the water director for the city of Santa Cruz sent that person along with some others this uh, email. And I'll just read a little bit of it because um, I think it is important. It said, uh, good morning all. Imagine my surprise when reading the guest commentary in today's Sentinel to find myself being referred to and quoted supporting your continuing claim that Santa Cruz has the water to supply the Soquel Creek Water District to address seawater intrusion issue in their basin. When I'm on record, and that's in red, in several forms, including April 1st Water Commission meeting as saying just the opposite. I don't need to go on and read it, I don't think, but um, this is part of our challenge is um, people get positioned and um, I think as data comes along, such as April, that was in the April 1st, which is I think the chart that's up here now, uh, demonstrating the, that the claims made in the editorial are not correct and continue to do that. Um, you know, it's one of the challenges we face as a district to, to do what we feel is best for our customers and the community to try to dispel some of that. And we appreciate Ms. Menard actually uh, taking the lead on that, as she has done in, in previous um, times too. So um, we, we do appreciate that. And I think her response is actually attached as a correspondence. Yeah, and I just wanted to add that um, you know, there are some people that are just going to keep putting this forward in spite of the facts. Yeah. I mean, we have lots of examples today of people saying things just despite look and just they don't want to see the facts. And I mean, I think when she says that there isn't enough surface water to reliably solve both the city's need for a drought supply and to protect groundwater resources in our part of the basin from seawater intrusion and to reliably meet SoCal's need for water to create and maintain a seawater intrusion barrier. There isn't enough uh, without yeah. something like your water SoCal. So I think it's really clear, but I, we're going to keep hearing people but saying it's, it's, something it's else. Yeah, but, but I do think it's our duty to the customers and the public to, to take at least some steps sometime to dispel it. Uh, and the irony is we continue to work with the city on many facets, including taking uh, uh, river water when and where appropriate. So anyway, putting that out there. And then the next one a is uh, Senate Bill 332, excuse me? Just a question on that. Huh? Um, so here this editorial gets out in the Sentinel. Mm -hmm. Somebody reads it. This is a very clear response from Rosemary Menard, but it didn't go out to the general public. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on? Well, that's a, that's a, uh, a good question. Getting, get, getting um, information out. You know, I'm reminded of the story my dad told me <laughs> once about uh, Mark Twain uh, way back when got in, uh, there was this argument and some lady, I uh, forget the, the author's name, but in the New York Times for, uh, did this big uh, editorial against uh, Mark Twain and he just came back on a full page and wrote the word tat. And what it was meant to say is tit for tat and we don't want to get into that I mean I think it doesn't you know we we can find maybe it's appropriate to come back with an editorial at the at another time um, mm -hmm. and we'll consider that we have other avenues plus that at our disposal um, and I see Melanie wants to may want to at chime in on this uh, we tend to take a more generative uh, approach versus uh, the negativity that's out there. I think people respond better to that. But if the board has direction of us, we're, you know, we're certainly open. And Melanie? Yeah, I just wanted, we did um, ask Rosemary if it was okay for us to put it as a resource on our website. So if people come to you and, and ask this question, mm -hmm. you can point to them um, with, with her email. So we redacted personal information related to those that were s it was sent to and Rosemary's like phone number at the bottom, but that is accessible and, and <coughs> we work with her to make sure she is fine with putting it up there. Yeah, I could just uh, comment that I was approached about that column <laughs> by too. several different people who, and there were people who mean no harm to the district or any other thing. Right. I mean, they were just <coughs> neutral, but they said, this sounds like a really important point of view and I had to point out to them you know, I had to go through and explain that, uh, explain what the issues were in, <coughs> the, in, in the errors in that uh, present, you know, in that editorial. 
So it just feel Maybe even better in a little, there'd been a response in the paper. Okay. Yeah. But I no, completely but it's her decision too. I completely agree with the two previous speakers. I think the thing that did in the desal project was people would say things like that and put things in the paper and the director at that time of the city's water didn't do anything. He just sat there and said, well, we know we're right. And that's what did it in because then everyone believed those false things. Mm -hmm. If you don't respond to them, crazy. then people think, well, must be true. Yeah, it's just crazy. Okay. So I think we need to respond. Mm -hmm. Okay. I All agree. Right. I agree as well. Would you guys like us to <coughs> coordinate with the Sentinel to do a commentary response? I think, I think coordinating yes. with, with, with Rosemary, so because she's been very clear and they keep quoting her. And I think that if she's willing to have that go out, I mean, she, I mean, she said it like in bright red. I don't even know if we can do that in the paper, but you know, <laughs> oh. <laughs> you know, she's tried to make it really clear. Okay, that it ticks her off when people keep misrepresenting. All right. her. Let us take that feedback back, mm -hmm. and, uh, we'll, and we'll generate some. Another piece of information that was in the same presentation was, um, and it was also presented to the. Uh, um, ground or sustainability plan mm -hmm. uh, advisory Bye. committee was the effect of climate change on on the river flow and so e you know even in present conditions there's not enough but certainly if in the future be even less it was yeah. pretty pretty remarkable how the projections for river flow were, were lower maybe it's in this I'm sorry oh. and, and maybe in a simple way present the ideas that were shown by the model that really the only way for this all to work <laughs> is, is to have pure water Soco. like their project doesn't work without it right and that is what the modeling shown I mean here's the table that they presented April 1st and if you the right. two I like to I mean first of all none of the scenarios produce uh, excess what this is excess water climate change scenarios on the left and what if they uh, update Graham Hill to improve the water quality, which uh, they'll, they'll need to do in the future. Um, and this is assuming that uh, they get the water rights to, to uh, send us the water. So there are a lot of assumptions built into this. Even with all those assumptions, uh, none of the scenarios show the 1,500 acre feet available. The good news is sometimes uh, uh, there's 300 feet, acre feet of water available and 1,500 feet is our defined problem. The interesting thing to me in this chart is if you look at historical, that it's available depending on which demand projection, they're short term and they're long term, but we'll just take the top line. Uh, based on just the climate change, the climate that we've had, there's 0% water available. 0% of the time is there 1,500, uh, 1500 acre feet available. The other part of that is if you go to the bottom, I, th yeah, the catalog, uh, yeah, the catalog uh, model, I, Bruce Daniels, correct me if I'm wrong, that's the, is that the wetter model or is it the GFDL? Um, catalog is drier. Okay, catalog's drier, so it's the GFDL that is the wetter uh, one where they get, we actually get more water than we're getting now, and they're still not, there's still very little uh, chance, zero to 10 in those uh, before they upgrade the plant and then uh, 15 to 55 when they do upgrade it, um, uh, even when it's wetter, and that's because climate change is predicting those storms closer together. So, and then of course, if it's drier, uh, there's even less. So it's really a, a no win situation in any of the scenarios, historical, uh, future wetter, future drier. So under any condition, um, so that's what they presented. The city of Santa Cruz Water Department, their modeling team presented it April 1st to their joint committee. Um, so again, we'll need to somehow f find a way to convey this uh, data out to the public. Um, and I appreciate the feedback. It's good to hear that you're, you yeah. know, somebody's commenting to you about the misinformation out there. Yeah, so it's an opportunity. Yeah, it's an excellent. Teachable moment. Yeah. But the, I agree with Tom to not make it too complicated. Yeah, yeah, that's the challenge, right? <laughs> because it's this is complicated. <laughs> yeah. I think the other thing is that in those years when they can give us some, some percentage of the years they can give us the full 1,500, mm -hmm. there's a huge percentage when they can't. 
and those years they're taking water back right. from the basin. Well, the modeling does show that they're at least in the in the model runs they have done, and of course they'll try to continue to refine it because it hasn't worked yet. That uh, pure water soquel is needed because when they go to draw large quantities out, right. the water the those troughs below the protected yeah, water. and seawater intrusion yes. uh, will come in. So it continues. Yeah, to come when in. It, when it's so complicated and so much is said, people can glom on to one little part right. that supports their position. Right. And take it out of context. Yeah, I mean, I can. I hear about how if if both uh, the um, aquifer storage and recovery and the um, advanced water. water purification and recharging into the basin happen, that the water levels would be above yeah. above <laughs> the surface, and you wouldn't operate it that way. No. You well, it's, that's, it's only the case because they stuck some of their injection wells right next to one of our injection wells. So, yeah, sure. Yeah. Just so don't, it, don't it, do that. Again, it, if yeah. you have a, a certain bias and it's complicated, mm -hmm. you, can, you can pick and choose what you like. Yeah. And, it, and Try to instill fear into right. the public yeah. or that right. sort of thing. So, so whatever goes out, and we've got a... We've, we've got, got a good team. We can, we can and if you, if you want to appoint a... Um, uh, a director or two to work with us, that's fine too. Well, there, there is an outreach committee. Right. Okay. Happy, yeah. okay, we'll we'll invoke the outreach committee. Thank you. <coughs> yeah. Mm. Kind of yeah. Sort of yeah. boil it down like three simple water. points yeah. and bullet points. I think you know. one of the appeals uh, one of the appeal of the part of the appeal that for the people that came up to me was, Oh, this will be a cost this will be a lot cheaper than having to build this big water plant mm -hmm. because we can mm -hmm. actually use this water and right. so and Walking that back was a very, uh, yeah. you know, though it's necessarily going to be a little complicated, I, I believe, because it is a complicated concept, but um, it would be worth working to simplify. Mm -hmm. And Ms. Menard has come out and said that uh, even whatever water is available be a, at least as costly, if not more, than Pure Water Soquel, and certainly uh, with grants it'll be much more. So that's on record too. Yeah, and some of those so we need to get some really of that information. Some of the really out. clear statements that are in bold okay. and mm -hmm. then All some right. of the really good conclusions that it just doesn't work without it. Okay. I've got an action item. Yeah. <laughs> we'll work right. on it yeah. together. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, so yeah, this is just continuing on on that uh, her response. You can see it was quite lengthy. She she actually put a fair amount of effort and time into it. Um, so that's, again, very much appreciated to our partners over there in Santa Cruz. The next item is uh, uh, Senate Bill 332, the Ocean Bay Water uh, Wastewater Discharges. Uh, this is a bill by uh, Senator Hertzberg and Wiener. Uh, it's a two-year bill. Uh, we were uh, encouraged by uh, these environmental groups, if you can go down to uh, uh, Ann Hertzberg's office, to attend uh, uh, this event, Point Positive, which I, I love the name of because there's so much negative out there in the world. And Point Positive is when you're going down a stream, you try to point to the way to go, not point to the way not to go. So Point Positive um, you can save your life. And uh, you can see we were right there. Uh, the pro and this, their bill was all about really what Pure Water Soquel embodies. It's about uh, trying to minimize discharge of uh, treated affluent to a bay or estuary uh, by 50% in 2030 and 95% by 2040. It's, a, it's quite an aspirational bill, uh, but it, it has gained some momentum. You can see by the NRDC, quite the outfit there, the Sierra Club endorses it. Uh, Coast Keepers, you know, the list is kind of the who's who Save of our environmental. Shores, Save Our rider. Shores, uh, Surf Rider. So that, you know, kind of putting on our environmental side of us, uh, that makes us feel good about the project that we're doing. It's in line with the bill they're supporting and we're, in, <coughs> and we're in discussions with these groups uh, and their discussions with us because uh, I think we got a good project. So that was that. Just wanted to show that. And we were up there, and it was a it was a, a really good event. Again, hat off, hats off to uh, Vi and Becca um, for going up there. And 
I'll just shout out that Vi actually wanted to drive the uh, the mobile learning unit huh? up there, but we didn't let her. It was raining, and I just we just you know safety is paramount. Um, but she set up a booth and a lot of attention there. Um, so next one is just a, a shout out to two of our staff members, special districts, movers and shakers forum. They, I think we recognize these two people. Again, this is uh, for some of the uh, outreach excellence <coughs> that was done and this was featured in their magazine. So uh, I thought- uh, And she's wearing the same outfit. <laughs> <laughs> I had the same jet. I had the same suit on as in another picture in there. So you know, when you got three of them, they, you rotate them. So um, what's I Taj wearing? I think Taj is too. <laughs> 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 hey, uh, so just proud of our team. Yes. You know, and I think it gets recognized by third parties. So uh, just really thank y'all for that. And I, that concludes my portion. Okay. Um, that is it for the management. Yeah, I just want to no. thank. Um, that's what I'm saying. I want to thank Melanie and Taj for all all you did on that. That was a fantastic outreach effort. Yeah. Very grassroots too. Yeah. And so that was. So that was the management update. Any um, public comment on the management update? Thank you. Becky Steinbruner. I want to submit, since you've spent a good amount of time discussing it, I'd like to submit it for your minutes record, a copy of Mr. Scott McGilvery's, I think, excellent <laughs> article in the Santa Cruz Sentinel. He took his information from facts on Santa Cruz City's website. And I'm also going to pass around to you, and there's a copy for the minutes, um, a copy of a slide that Santa Cruz City Water Staff Person Toby Goddard presented, projected reservoir t uh, drawdown, showing um, as of October of last year, the reservoir was 90% full. Mr. McGilvray wrote in a note to me, he couldn't be here tonight, he's on the radio, that um, the city, uh, and this was said, you were, you were there, you heard it, the city's uh, demand has been reduced from 3.2 billion gallons, which is in the, s the slide you have here. That's not the, the demand anymore. It's 2.7 billion gallons a year. And although um, even if the, the reservoir were 75% full, the city could still send Soquel Creek Water District 450 million gallons. That's a lot of water. I want to send this to you. There's one for each of you and one for the minutes. And I want to say that the city under Prop 218 cannot charge you more than what it costs them to produce the water. And I want to say that you could be cooperating with them to help them with their infrastructure in, uh, capital improvements at the Graham Hill mm -hmm. and the inner tie enlargement so that you could get more water. And you could probably get a grant for that too. No. They're it's getting grants. <laughs> um, I, wanna, I wanna read to you from the response to comments. This is the uh, very large document that some of you didn't even know existed and you gave the public 10 days to read before you certified your EIR. Here's what Rosemary Menard said, and I'm gonna quote her because this is a public document. Um, an analysis should be completed that confirms the need to receive 300 acre feet each year as opposed to a potentially varied regime of water transfers that achieve the same supply reliability objectives. The city is strongly committed to the success of a project that improves water reliability for the city, other agencies, and has beneficial impacts to the basin, and without evidence to the contrary, believes a modified operational approach may be equally successful. This is her comment to your draft EIR for Pure Water SoCal. And there's more, but I'm almost out of time. I wanna say that um, I, I really f um, am quite offended that you laugh at Thank people you. when you. they have an Thank opinion you. different than your own. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your respect. Is there anyone else? I'd, I'd like to respond. I think that's Great. a perfect example of how you reading something and seeing something and me hearing it, and I actually did read that, 
have a totally different interpretation of what Rosemary said. Please sit down. Said. So that's, that's okay. it's just amazing to me. That's going to keep happening, so okay. get over it. Well, it, yeah. Please it, sit yes down. Your, your time is up. Please sit I down, Ms. Steinbrenner. I public comment. No. Please respect oh, everybody. This representation is going to did. continue. So your time is up. Thank you for your transparency. Thank you. Okay, so let us move on to item 6.1. Oh, no, wait, sorry. Yeah, District Council. Right. Oh. Um, I did go to ACWA and attended a couple of things. One of the, at the Legal Affairs Committee, they did bring up the fact that there's a push now to hold public agencies liable under inverse condemnation, which is strict liability. There was a trial court decision down in Southern California involving a fire. A car rolled over, caused a fire to start. Fire hit a pump station, and because one of the wires in the pump station wasn't done correctly, it shorted and they actually held the water district liable for $72 million in inverse condemnation damages. JPIA actually settled that case at the trial level, so there's no appellate decision yet, but it looks like there might be a focus in that direction, and right now there's a big effort by PG and other utilities to get themselves exempted, but there's some concern that it might still be out there for other agencies, so it's something to be concerned about. Also, the uh, Wazowski or Wykowski bill is moving forward again on ADUs with a broader interpretation, which basically would, I think, eliminate our ability to impose water demand offset fees in addition to meter requirements. Um, so that's of that's of some concern too. And there, there are at least two water tax bills floating through the assembly again. One of which uh, was reported out earlier this year, another one by, I think she an assemblyman now, Caballero, which is not a tax, but rather established as a fund. Mm -hmm. um, but it looks like all of that's gonna be coming down the line. Thank you. Any questions on that? Alrighty then, item 6.1. Conditional and unconditional will serves. Right, there are four for your consideration tonight, three single family homes and an ADU. Questions? Public comment? Seeing none, I'll move approval of these four. A second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Opposed. That motion carries. We'll go on to 6.2. We did that already, so we'll go with 6.3. So you've seen this project come uh, before the board uh, last year. We bid it out, and I believe it was over 900 some odd thousand dollars for the full project, and that was well over our budget. So we um, did s split it up, and the dis the board staff has acquired the uh, the electrical equipment and then the pumping equipment. And this bid before you is what's remaining, and that includes the uh, site fencing, the paving installation of the electrical equipment, uh, electrical transformer, storm drain, piping, uh, and, and that's about it. We only got two bids, and they were very different, separated by 280,000 some odd dollars. Um, there was a minor uh, variance in the low bid where the bidder did not submit a bid bond, but we contacted the bidder and he said he would be willing to still perform the work uh, if we would accept a bid bond. He said he had put one in, but it, it didn't get processed by his bonding company in time and it did show up um, two days later. So we do have a bid bond to, to guarantee the bid. Um, it's my recommendation that we award this bid to ENS Trucking for $419,505. And move forward with building this project. Okay. Questions, Bruce. I noticed a, well, may may be a discrepancy or maybe just my confusion. But on the motions, motion number five there is to authorize the general manager to sign the purchase order, and the very next page, it talks about the president and the clerk of the board authorized to make and enter into 
A written contract. And we have two. We have a contract and then we have a purchase order. Okay, so they're different things. Then. They are different. Okay. Yep. All right, good. Uh, and usually do your, your homework and before you make a recommendation, what can you tell us about the, the low bidder? Uh, ENS Trucking has been around for, for decades. They do a lot of work for private entities, but they do install several water services for you know, those well serves that you just uh, saw. Um, they did put in a water main extension for Potbelly Beach, phase two. Um, they were the subcontractor for uh, Majora Brothers at the Twin Lakes Church site. They did all the grading and access and, and site prep. Um, and they've also done some pump station work for the district at the Vista Del Mar um, tank years ago. Um, this, this is, uh, they're more than qualified to perform this work. Um, they have subcontractors to, to perform the electrical work and fencing <coughs> work. So what remains is in their wheelhouse okay. very easily. I, I'm confident they can do this work. Any public comment on this item? Thank you, Becky Steinbrunner, resident of rural Aptos, and I go by this site every day. Um, back in 2015, when I appealed the Aptos Village project uh, changes to their big plan, um, moving the well site to this location was one of the changes on the project. At the time, I asked for uh, renderings of the, what it was going to look like, and what you sent me was a small house, sort of a housed well site. And now I'm not seeing any of that, um, but I am seeing a discussion about fencing. So what I would like is a description of what it is going to look like for those who pass by every day. Thank you. I would make the motions. Okay. I'll second. Then moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries. Thank you. All right. What have we got next? We have 6.4. I think four. we need a roll. Do we need a roll call now? Oh, one of those is a resolution. One was a resolution. Yep. Resolution. Oh. The resolution. Sorry. Um, mm. You're right. Shelly's right. <laughs> Try it again. Can we walk that back and start? We can. We can. St we can still. So roll call. Director Lather. Yes. Vice President Daniels. Yes. Director Jaffe. Yes. Director Christensen. Yes. And President Lahue. Yes. Oh, still passes. <laughs> All right. So, um, back to the LAFCO. Yeah. Thing. So this at May seventh meeting, uh, Director Christensen expressed some <laughs> interest and <laughs> some hesitation about. Uh, uh, her name being thrown in the in the mix for uh, alternate on the LAFCO um, board. Uh, I know uh, Director Lather did that last time, and now she is uh, an actual director on the board. So the what's before you tonight is if you want to nominate a district board member uh, or anybody else uh, on an independent special district uh, in Santa Cruz County as an alternate as a special district member on the LAFCO board. And if you do, then um, give the board pre president um, direction regarding your preference and, and us to submit the form. Oh, okay, I'll do that. I, I was one of them, I was just one of my concerns was I'm currently on the stormwater committee me meeting, and it, it ended up taking a lot of time just waiting, waiting around for a 10-minute meeting, mm. <laughs> and I was just concerned about what kind of what. Yeah. What it was, I've been interested in the whole issue that LAFCO is supposed to address. So, uh, the, the meetings are one hour usually, sometimes right. more. And uh, once a month, or they're, they're once, once a, month a month, plus well maybe ten a year. Okay, um, probably a lot more important than Zone Five. And yeah, well and you know it governs all you know the prevention of urban sprawl is kind of the, and preservation of ag and open yeah. space. So, um, it's an important commission. Mm -hmm. um, they're very efficient meetings. It's a well-run but small organization. But um, you do have to fill out the application, yeah. right? I haven't done it yet. Yeah. 
Right. Well, you have some time. So um, I make the three motion for you. I make the three motions. No, but needs a motion, doesn't it? Yep, it does. We have to nominate you. Nominate you. Oh, okay. I'll second that. Okay, all in favor? I'm wondering if I should say no. Quick, let's pass it. I don't want you with me. No, it's, no, a, it's yes an honor, actually. No, I, yeah. no I, I would be willing to attend as a, mm -hmm. you know, my usual and capacity. Is. And the alternate usually goes to most of the meetings so that they're kind of up on things, mm -hmm. uh, not just when the other one doesn't show up. You know where the meetings are held. Or yep. Yep. Are there sch scheduled at a regular time, unlike a stormwater meeting? First Wednesday of the month, uh, 10 a.m. on the time line. That's right. Okay, yeah. so, so we vote on this. We have any before you vote. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, we we had a motion or did we? No, not I yet. I motioned it. Okay. We did a motion. Second. One motion. Second second it. It. And you seconded. Okay. Well, any public comment on this item? All right. Seeing none. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Good. Carla. Thank you, Carla. <laughs> you opposed? Oh, I, I said aye. Uh, there may be aye. someone else running aye. for that position, so you never know. No, it's not a yes. It is not, not a given. It's not a sure thing. No. Okay, and then um, the next item is one that was presented at the um, MGA meeting, which was the semi-annual annual groundwater report. Yeah, so I'll just make a couple comments if you don't mind. Um, first of all, I, I hear, you know, for since the the drought occurred, a lot of agencies um, were able to scale back on their water production customers scale back on their uses so we could all produce less. It was a statewide phenomena. And recently you've seen a lot of uh, agencies bounce back to, to where they were in 2013. Fortunately in Santa Cruz County we've been slower to, to rebound, but we have started. Over the last two years consumption has gone up and therefore water levels have gone down and, and dropped. And that's a very uh, important point to make because I hear talk of Santa Cruz has lowered their consumption. It should, we should be clear that's a near-term, uh, uh, short-term consumption that they're doing. But even with that, because it's stable where they're at now, we see water levels dropping. And not only on top of that, um, why we don't see, uh, uh, have not monitored uh, seawater intrusion uh, advancing in most wells, we did see um, uh, the water level in SCA2B, which is a very important well. And um, uh, let's see, uh, we did see an increase in that well, along with a decline in water level at SC9C uh, below its protective elevation, which means you know seawater uh, to protect against seawater intrusion. So. You know, what that translates to is even in under the best of conditions in, uh, where we've used the, le the least amount of water we've used in a long time in this area, we see that rebounding, the usage rebounding, and, w and we know there's pent up um, housing, there's, there's other things that going on that we can s anticipate this continuing. Uh, five of the 13 monitoring wells are still below protective water levels and that's ticking, probably will, will increase if this trend increases. Um, so as a hydrologist, uh, Montgomery and Associates concluded in the report, the basin continues to be in critically overdrafted condition, uh, which uh, coincides with the state's uh, determination also. So I be, there's a lot of graphs in here that they've done, they've, you know, they're, they're scientists to the T, but bottom line is the curve has changed over the last two years. Uh, consumption has increased and water levels are dropping. So uh, it just, uh, and we know that seawater intrusion through the Denmark study is right at the coast where it's not already on shore. Even with those best conditions that we had two years ago, the hydrologist produced a map, which we've shown here, that there's a greater than 50%, which could be 70, 80, 90, uh, opportunity for seawater intrusion or chance of seawater intrusion to impact our wells. And now that situation's gotten worse, so those that estimate, you know, they would increase. So it's 
it's not good news, but it's our, it's our reality and what we have to live with. So I think it reinforces the, the work that we're doing with the community water plan on uh, the water transfers, uh, pure water Soquel, even stormwater recharge, which we had the, uh, the KION out today and we talked about that. So that's on the news tomorrow, I believe. So it, it just reinforces our actions. Any questions? So when you're Comments? talking about the increase at uh, SCA2B, mm -hmm. you're talking about increase in salinity. Right. Okay. Yeah. Not in water levels. Well, no, not in water levels. Let me yeah, get okay. back to my, I'll, yeah. I'll read it because I may There's still five below protected levels or maybe we added a sixth. Yeah. Yeah, it may, it may have climbed to six. I may have, it, yeah, it may have gone to six now. I think yeah. that is correct. So I think it's, it's even nine that's dropped out. It's worse than I had um, mentioned, but the groundwater levels dropped below protective elevations at SC9C in 2018. And then, um, let me get up to my report here, my cover, because I try to put it in a very concise format because I know this is a lot of information. And the um, also seawater intrusion has increased in monitoring well SCA2B. Not good news, but again, our reality, and at least uh, we have a lot of data which to help drive our decisions. Okay. Well, and just, yeah, and just in case people, anyone thought that the three seasons of normal rainfall or heavy rainfall would solve this problem, it's not going to. Well, definitely not this year. This we've had pretty much a normal year. Mm -hmm. yeah. Amazing how many people think, gosh, we've had such a m huge amount of water this year. Mm -hmm. well, After years of drought, they think <laughs> this is a flood. And it's not. Mm -hmm. I it's personally a lost year. my perspective myself. <laughs> <laughs> I think it yep. did come frequently. Mm -hmm. yeah. Gave people an impression. And people think about the last week. Mm -hmm. right. It's unusual. Mm -hmm. I, I've had people come up to me and say, it's, it's good now, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that's. Nope. That's the perception. Mm -hmm. um, any public comment on this? Thank you. Becky Steinbrenner, resident of Aptos. I just want to um, reiterate what Rosemary Menard <coughs> and information from Santa Cruz City uh, put out in their annual water reports that their demand is flat for the next 20 or 30 years. And their usage is not rebounding. Their, their customers are staying at low in their use. I, I looked at these graphs and I looked at the graph for SCA2B <coughs> and saw that the chloride was going up, but I also saw that the groundwater elevation was stable, if not improving. I looked at the map to see where that, wa where that monitoring well is and it's right next to SCA3B. SCA3B also was not looking so good until new sampling equipment was installed in March of 2012, and now it looks good. So what I want to find out is um, how, uh, how do we evaluate the effectiveness and accuracy of the sampling um, equipment that's in SCA2B? Has that been looked at? I also um, want to point out to you that perhaps um, any water injection should be considered in the area closer to SCA2B rather than Twin Lakes, <laughs> where uh, in a technical memorandum and also in your draft EIR and final EIR, it says that water levels have recovered and are fine. So I've l looked through here and what I keep seeing, other than the five, now you say six, monitoring wells that are not looking so good, there are 13 that look really good and have recovered. Moran Lake is looking much, much better. So are you gonna look at the glass that's empty, half empty, or glass that's half full? And I just wanna point out to you, to you that, um, in, in fact, here on page 178 of your packet, 
Concentrations in the Moran Lake medium <coughs> monitoring well indicate seawater intrusion in the past, but now has a decreasing trend, which suggests seawater intrusion is no longer occurring in the area of the Prisma A unit. Um, in the summary, groundwater levels are at a protective elevation established by Silcock Creek Water District and the city at a majority of the coastal monitoring wells. There are those five wells that um, are, are not as good, but even those wells stay concentration that these wells are stable or decreasing. Concentration at these wells are stable or decreasing. Concentrations are stable and decreasing show an increasing trend over the last two years despite groundwater levels being above protective levels. Thank you. It depends on your point Time of view, up. doesn't it, and what you want to accomplish. Time is up. Thank you. I'll just take a statement from the summary statement from, from the report that says, full groundwater level recovery will not be achieved until groundwater levels are at protective elevations at all coastal monitoring wells, period. I just wanted to point out something. If you look on page 182, at the graphs there, um, it shows up best on the bottom one, the third one. The blue bar is our bar, and indeed, for the, the last two bars, are, the blue has gone up, so our pumping is larger last year than it was the year before. But if you also look at the top bar, the purple one, that's the city's pumping. And it's clear the city's pumping last year was more than the year before. So it's not just us that's pumping heavier, it's the city too. And I'll, I'll just make note that the Orange Central's water district is not included on that graph. Yep. Okay, just because it could skew things. Now, there's definitely a rebound, so as, as good as it, we've kind of passed that best peak. Orange, now Orange is, the, is the private and small water systems. Okay. Uh, and those aren't on there. Green is the central. And oh, green is central? Green is central, and that's pretty much the same. It's yeah, like. the, the orange, I meant, private pumpers. Yes. Okay. Thank you for that correction. Right. Good, thank you. Um, item 6.6, .6, this is an RFQ for a progressive design build. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna present this item tonight, thank you. I do have a couple slides, but basically the purpose of this agenda item is to ask the board for authorization to release a request for qualifications for design build services for the conveyance project of the Pure Water SoCal project. As you know, this is one of our main schematics of what the Pure Water SoCal project is. I just want to highlight it again. What it does include are three primary components. The treatment facilities that would be split with the tertiary treatment at the Santa Cruz Wastewater Treatment Facility, the purification treatment at the Chanticleer site, and, three, um, and then in the seawater intrusion prevention injection wells. Um, in Aptos, specifically what we're looking at right now based upon our narrowing analysis is at Monterey Avenue, Twin Lakes Church, and Willowbrook Lane. In addition to these um, stationary locations, we also need the pipeline and the conveyance system to convey the water. And so um, the conveyance structure of the Pure Water SoCal project includes tertiary pipeline, um, RO or reverse osmosis concentrate, and purified pipelines, and the purple line illustrates the alignment where the tertiary and the RO concentrate would go. Um, that is approximately about 4.5 miles. And then the blue pipeline is the purified pipeline, and that is also about four and a half miles. So total, the conveyance piece of the Pure Water SoCal project is about nine miles of pipeline. Now typically, um, when we go out for um, procurement of services for construction or design, we do the traditional design bid build. Um, and in, in that step, when we're looking for qualified uh, consultants or contractors, we do a, a single step. What we're foreseeing with this procurement, which is a uh, design build, is a two-step process, and this is just an illustration, where first we would um, issue out a request for qualifications, and um, through that process, we would then receive statements of qualifications. We'd review those statement of qualifications, we'd shortlist uh, a few of the qualified teams, and then from that shortlisted uh, group of teams, we would then issue out a request for proposals. Um, 
at that step, then we would receive those proposals. Those proposals would include a detailed approach, their scope, and some cost-related criteria. And through that process, we would then select um, and interview firms to ultimately select the team that would design and build the conveyance project. The first step, as I mentioned, is this request for qualifications. Um, what we're requesting um, teams to provide in their statement is primarily would go into these eight categories. First, we would like them to describe what their team structure is like. Uh, we really want them to go into detail on, on what their organization, um, how it's built, and the personnel, both in terms of what their experience is as a whole team, uh, the individual teams, if they have teams coming together, one from design and one from uh, the construction, and specifically what's the experience of key personnel. Uh, we also want them to fill out a chart and explain and describe uh, similar projects that they've done, either together or individually. We'd also like them to discuss their capacity. Um, are they able to, to take on a project of this size and magnitude? We obviously want to hire somebody that can carry us through from start to finish. Um, permitting is, is an important component, so we would like them to describe the experience they have with permitting. We also want them to talk about their experience or ways that they could avoid or minimize community impact. Um, with this, m this style of uh, procurement, it really does create and lend itself to some innovation and uh, allows the team to kind of describe maybe some measures that they would want to implement. The, a lot of the pipeline configurations are in the street right-of-way. So uh, if there are ways that they have done and want to uh, explain to us how they can reduce those impacts, we want them to share that in their statement. Safety is also very important, so we do have a section related to uh, their track record. And we really want to also um, have them kind of explain the depth of their financial capability, the insurance, and any kind of um, legal qualifying experience that they have. Can I ask you a question about that? Mm -hmm. Just um, do we ever ask like if they have any particular ways to minimize environmental impact, like as far as like ways of drilling so that they avoid? Certain yes, yes, and okay. so in, and in the environmental impact report, we've identified certain areas that they could do different types of. They would address that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Melanie, their, their ability to do that. I, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, you've asked them to bring any innovation or ingenuity they have, so that that's, you know, and we've already heard some ideas that are interesting. But it'd be nice to have that in there, yeah. too, just specifically. So it, is it more at the proposal stage that you evaluate what the exact team's going to be? Because, you know, you, there could be really qualified people at, at a firm or in a group, project group they might not be the ones actually working on it. We definitely want them, when they submit a statement of qualification, it's this is who we are and this is what we bring to the project. And so from that, we, we really prefer that they don't change out who they submit um, within their team as, they, as though they described, so they can go in and go through a full proposal process and change that up. Uh, the key personnel part is very important. Um, after the design builder is selected, there's primarily the way that the project would be rolled out is uh, three phases. The first phase is the design and pre-construction services. So this is where, uh, as we've um, heard before from our, our Brown and Caldwell project team, this is a very collaborative effort, uh, working with the district, with um, regulators, with the design build team, we would go back and forth on designing the project, getting interim cost estimates, and refining the project as defined and what the associated costs are. Um, through that process, it, it is a somewhat of an open book process, so we can work with them on, on ways to s stay within budget um, and also ways that we can be creative and what that would be as we kind of, if you guys remember that illustration, it kind of goes like that until we narrow down um, it's not until the point where we get to some, some key milestones or what um, our project team likes to call these guaranteed prices is when we can decide whether or not we are comfortable with the design and that cost and then it no longer needs to be as collaborative or if we want to continue to a guaranteed price. What's nice about that for the district is that I know the board has always um, inquired about uh, potential off-ramps. If there is some 
place where we're not comfortable, there are some steps where we could off ramp um, and either go back through the process again or we could, you know, obviously try to see before we take that ramp, what can we do to fix that. Once we um, do get to a guaranteed max price, then it would go into the phase two where then um, the design build team would, would build the project, complete the design, and um, we would get the project built and ready to plug into the treatment facilities. There is a third phase that uh, would be as needed. Um, once, the, once the systems are all connected together, if we do feel we want to have the team still you know, on board while we do start up and commissioning, we may want to keep them on on, a, on an as needed or, or s I th guess this would be a to be determined what that phase three amount would be. I just walked through that. Good thing I read it. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is the schedule uh, of how we're proposing to issue the request for qualifications. Uh, we would like to put the RFQ on the website um, May 22nd, and that would be available for about a month where then we would ask proposers to submit a statement of qualifications on June 19th. Um, then through our review process, a selection team would review those SOQs, shortlist, and we would then release the RFP on July 10th, um, giving about a couple months for the proposals to be prepared and submitted back to us, reviewed by our, again, our selection team, and then having interviews in mid-October so that we can look to the issuing a notice of award um, in the end of the year around November. This schedule really was kind of predicated upon making sure that we give the contractor and the design team uh, enough time to, to design it and build it and still be online by the board's goal of the end of 2022. Um, this is just a screenshot of our website. I don't know if, if anybody's ever been on our, our website's page specifically for RFPs and RFQs, but this is our RFP and RFQ page, and right here we have this listed where uh, the RFQ would uh, be available and anybody who was interested could then click on that and download the documents. Uh, we are encouraging people to check back if they are interested in proposing in case we issue, you know, follow-up documents. And then I'll just conclude with, um, at this point, the possible board actions that we're asking for the board tonight is to authorize district staff to release the RFQ. Um, designate up to two directors to be on a review and selection committee if, if that's desired, and um, authorize that team to review the RFQs to be, to be then moved on to shortlist and then issue out the RFP. And then the fourth one would be to take no action. Okay, thank you. Um, a question. Question and then you have some. Yeah, who's, um, who's deter who determines the yeah. The qualifications yeah, that you want for this client. Right. Are you writing that up, or is yeah? Within the RFQ, there is a s there there is um, a section that talks about like what I was talking those eight criteria of things that we'd like them to provide, and we also have um, a percentage scoring. So it would go through, you know, that kind of an evaluation period. But and who would do that would be the selection uh, team. We have a team that's experienced with this and knows what's important, and so that's embedded. That's in what I was trying to say. Yeah. 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 It, so we There's we a will lot going on in th those simple that simple title design build. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. We um, uh, as outlined in the staff memo, the selection and review committee would be comprised of a couple of the um, management team at the district, as well as Brown and Caldwell. So they are our, our owners agent and program management team. And then, and then, if the board would also like to be on that, we'd like to up to two. Okay. Um, any public comment on this item? Thank you, Becky Steinbruner. I predict that uh, Mr. Stephen Waite and IDE will be back. <laughs> He's been at your meetings before at these critical times, and I've looked up the company, and I'll bet they'll be here again. I want to again point out to you that um, that it appears to me and members of the public that you're just going down the road 
as if there is no legal action against you. And at the last meeting, Mr. Basso said that's not how it works. You, you, you don't expect people to stop what they're doing. Let me read to you what I am reading from the CEQA handbook under preliminary relief, chapter 23.86. When a CEQA action challenges a development or construction project, it is often unnecessary for the petitioner to seek preliminary relief. Project applicants are usually reluctant to proceed until the case is decided because an adverse decision may result in an order vacating the project approvals and enjoining further work. Furthermore, lenders may be unwilling to provide construction funding or other project-related loans while an action is pending. In other cases, however, preliminary re relief may be necessary to preserve the environmental status quo because proceeding with the project would cause irreparable environmental damage. You have a statement of overriding considerations here that you've approved. If preliminary relief is necessary to preserve the status quo pending a decision on the merits, which is what you have before you with the case 19 CV 00181, the petitioner may apply for an order staying operation of the agency's decision pending the trial court's decision on the merits. And that's what's scheduled for June 20th with a preliminary injunctive hearing. In addition, or in the alternative, the petitioner may apply for a temporary restraining order, which I've done three times and have felt compelled that I must because you're just not stopping. And preliminary injunction in joining further action on the project until the court renders its decision. I wanna say that again, until the court renders its decision. So here you are going down the road and it's costing your ratepayers a lot of money and yet, without any regard to the, what I and many, many others consider serious allegations of multiple violations of CEQA law. Yes, you can look away, Director Daniels, it's very, very polite. <laughs> it, I, I'm asking you to just respect this process. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Um, I would be willing to be part of the selection committee if anyone else wants to. I'd uh, like to re see Rochelle in particular because she has yeah. done this before. Would you like to do it? Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Would you be willing? I would love to. Good. I'm sending my kids away to college. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So she needs something to keep her I'll busy. I'll need something to keep me busy, yes. So the, the first selection portion would be like within the next month, right? No, that's just the that's soliciting. The, so that's just the request. In the summer. Um, in the summer. The end of June and a couple weeks in July. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, Any, would anybody else mm -hmm. around that? No, I, I think uh, I agree with Rochelle being on it and yeah, I think if you're it. willing to be on it, I think you do a great job. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, do we need a yes. motion on any of these? Yeah, three things? motions. Okay. So, so I'll make those three motions for okay. Rochelle and Tom. Okay. I'll second. Alrighty, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right, thank you. Um, and there was one email correspondence, um, which I think has been read and. Yeah, this is from, it's the oh. uh, email rebuttal from Rosemary Menard regarding the other case. Okay, so I think we are adjourned. Yahoo. We'll see you June 4th.